Okay, everyone, um, welcome to the second installment of our um, socially engaged philosophy video channel, YouTube channel. Um, today, our topic is science and values, and I'm glad that again, I'm joined by Alex Reutlinger, um, our expert, um, who will probably start us off and tell us something, um, what he has found out about science and values. Alex, nice to see you. Shoot. Yeah, nice, nice to see you again, Martin. And um, yeah, I'm no, no more of an expert than you are, I guess, on, on this topic. But I thought kind of for um, our chat today, we could um, kind of begin with um, uh, the following question. So science and values, that sounds like a very big and um, broad topic. But somehow you have to enter this, this whole discussion and topic. And I think one um, way to do so is to ask the following question. So can science um, be value-laden yeah, in the sense that um, moral and um, political values somehow enter scientific research and at the same time uh, the scientific research that is value-laden is also uh, still good and reliable scientific knowledge. Yeah, do these two things go together? Are they compatible? Being infected by values, so to speak, and being reliable knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I think one um, common view that people in um, philosophy of science and other fields of science studies held for some time and I think also a pretty common view outside of university buildings is that um, the answer is no, that's not possible. Yeah, Somehow um, being value laden, um, involving certain kind of evaluations of moral and political kinds um, diminishes the value of the knowledge that's produced in science. And um, hence, or well, that's the, the idea, we should, um, well, keep science free of these values. And if we do, then it's good science. And um, so the argument goes, so that's the, the view kind of more explicitly, um, somehow that's what makes science objective and reliable and whatever you like about science, this absence of value judgments. So that's one view and maybe one entry point for us um, to get into this discussion. What do you think about this? About this? Yeah, great. Um, let, me, let me try to a little bit unpack that, what you said, um, for those of us who are not so familiar with those, um, with those topics. Um, one thing that I feel is worth unpacking a little bit is the very notion of what a value is. Um, maybe we could say quite generally that a value is a commitment um, or something that one is trying to achieve, a goal, something that one deems worthy of pursuit. Um, so like a classical example would be like moral values, like kindness, um, moral goodness, or values like justice in society. Or, of course, values could also be bad values. Um, there could be values like an interest in profit. Well, if that is always bad, or, you know, we can easily imagine some more um, vicious and mean things that people strive for and that they deem valuable. So when we philosophers of science talk about science and values, it's worth pointing out that we don't just have the good values in mind, we have all values in mind because obviously if it was just about the good values or the very best values, then the issue of whether values in science is a problem would never really arise because we could easily um, see that, well, if science promotes those values, that's all for the good. So the worry is, are there vicious values? And of course, the second thing one needs to emphasize is that one person's good values is another person's vicious value. Um, as someone who is interested in the history of especially the social sciences, I'm keenly aware of the fact that for as long as we have social sciences, roughly for the last 120 years or so, there has been one debate over social science and values after another. 
And what is quite typical in the social sciences that one has controversies in which each side accuses the other side of bringing in social political values that shouldn't really be brought into science. So it's worth remembering that whenever one discusses science and values, one often discusses them in terms of accusations, right? I mean, think about someone like Trump, who says that the problem with climate science is that these climate scientists are all left-wing liberals that use climate science as a means for controlling our lives. At the same time, um, climate activists like Friday for Future will say about Trump that he's bringing in his profit interests and um, the interest of the coal industry, the, the value of profit in order to, and he, he undermines climate science in order pr to promote those values. So we're talking about something that is fiercely contested, right, in our, in our life. All the more reason, therefore, for us to make clear for ourselves how we want to think about this topic quite generally. And I guess that's the thing that you really invite us, invite us to do. That's right. And I would like to come back to this issue of controversy. So different things you can criticize um, about um, this relationship between science and values. But I think you're, you're exactly right to um, be a bit more precise on what values are. I mean, you already made a start and I wanted to add something on this topic of verification. Um, and um, kind of with reference to recent debates in philosophy of science, I think uh, it's important to realize that this position that we call the value-free ideal, this idea that um, good science is free of values, hinges on a certain distinction between um, what is sometimes called epistemic values and non-epistemic values. And roughly put, um, epis and ep these values are properties of theories, models, hypotheses in science that scientists are said to appreciate or like. But they are very different. So these epistemic values, they are properties that your favorite theory has and if it has that these values or these properties, then um, you think the theory is more likely to be true. Yeah, you, you become more confident that you are tracking something real. Yeah? So what are these epistemic values? So a lot of people think if your theory has the property of being compatible with available empirical data, or if it makes very good predictions repeatedly, then uh, this is an epistemic value of the theory because if it does these things, then you should be more confident than you were before that um, this theory that you like is true. But, and that's the important thing, not all values that might play a role in science are of this kind. Some of them are non-epistemic values and um, this is a pretty mixed bag of things and motivations, interests, things um, one appreciates or likes. I mean, there are, for instance, just to name two or three. So one is um, sometimes uh, called, um, an, uh, one type of non-epistemic value is sometimes called pragmatic or cognitive. And um, a prime example in this group of values is the simplicity or mathematical elegance of a theory. That's certainly something that uh, scientists appreciate some of the time, but um, it's usually not taken to be an indicator of um, truth. Yeah, your, th your theory might be simple, but false. Yeah, I'm saying this just as a standard view. This is controversial. Some people think that's not the case, but it's uh, one illustration of um, a pragmatic, non-epistemic value. But there are perhaps for our discussion more interesting kinds of non-epistemic values. Yeah, so you might think that um, there are social values, moral values, political values that um, somehow play a role in science. Yeah, so to promote health or well-being or social equality or democracy, 
um, or to prevent certain kind of harms to the environment, to prevent climate change, or um, what have you, things like that, even to make profit. Those are perhaps the more interesting non-epistemic values that um, are important for our chat today. Mm -hmm. And um, the point is, um, if, you if you have this value-free ideal view of science, then you think uh, science should be free of these things, yeah? Praising democracy, um, saving the environment, promoting social justice, um, well-being of people. That's uh, because these are non-epistemic values. They have nothing to do with the truth which may, might be conceived as the ultimate goal of, of science. Mm -hmm. Great, yes. Um, again, um, um, this brings to mind different, different um, uh, little snippets of, of ideas that, that come to mind relating to this. One bit I want, just want to give our viewers an illustration of how um, one person's um, epistemic value is another person's non-epistemic value. Um, here's an interesting one, namely simplicity, one that you already mentioned. Um, for many centuries, scientists actually thought that um, simplicity is a prime example of a really good indicator that a theory is true. And it's interesting to note the context in which they often thought this. They thought that, well, the world is designed by God, and God will always prefer the most simple and elegant solution. So therefore, God will not um, uh, rule the world by messy and complicated laws of nature, but God is likely to settle for the most simple laws of nature. Therefore, if we have two theories, and the one theory is more simple, has less laws of nature, is less complex, then that theory is more likely to be true. Now, while that made perfect sense in a theological context or in a form of science that was informed by theological considerations, it's not obviously true for a science in which theological considerations do not play a role. Because if there is no grand designer, why should the world prefer um, the most elegant and simple solution and not, in fact, be governed by an extremely messy one? So that is an example of a of a case where one person's simple theory, um, which is an epistemic value, which makes the theory more likely to be true for other people, will not be such an indicator. Another idea that came to mind by, by, by what you said is that we should, um, um, we should always be clear about that there are many different ways in which a value, let's just focus on the non-epistemic values now, the clearly moral and political ones, yeah. um, which that they can come in into science in different ways. And some of these ways will be acceptable to everyone, even to those who are defending the idea that science should in some fundamental sense be value-free. So for example, even a person who might insist that science should just be guided by the truth might very well think that the choice of research topics is no doubt um, influenced by and maybe should indeed be influenced by, cons by values. Um, so if we, have, if, we can, if we only have money and personnel to pursue one of two research projects, mm -hmm. And the one, say, is trying to find out what happens at, an, at a planet, um, uh, you know, 50 light years from here, and the other one is curing cancer, um, then this is, this is clearly a value-guided choice. Um, but no one will object to, well, few people will object to the idea that in that case, we are perfectly entitled to make that judgment on the basis of a value. I guess the the unease about values intruding science come in not at the point of choice of research topic, though sometimes they do even there uh, cause debate, but people get really worried about them when they fear that those values, and you already said as much, that those values 
guide our choice of which theory to accept. So when we have alternative theories that, ex that are good and bad in various ways in which they explain things, and we then say, well, actually, my progressive agenda um, inclines me to prefer this theory, and therefore we should take this theory to be more likely to be true. So when like values guide theory choice, or when like values guide which data to give attention to, um, those are sort of ways in which many philosophers and many scientists get nervous when, sign, when, when values come in at these points of choice. Yeah, right. I, I think this is um, kind of um, reflecting an important um, part of the debate in philosophy of science, what, what, what you've just said, mm -hmm. that in some sense it is more or less uncontroversial that um, if you think about what topic should we work on, um, which projects should be funded, which shouldn't, those uh, certainly um, are, these decisions are certainly based on value judgments. Yeah? So we think, what does our society need? Um, do we need this sort of research um, uh, or rather that sort of research? Do we need research that deals with, for instance, uh, a pandemic? Um, maybe yes, maybe no. And that's certainly value guided. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's right, at the heart of scientific research, one might say, once the topic is chosen and we've picked a certain methodology to pursue or investigate a topic and we start gathering data, representing data, and um, finally interpreting data, what do they mean? Do they, are they really pro, um, kind of making a certain hypothesis more likely to be true rather than not? Um, that's the crux of the matter. Yeah, that's where uh, people say, no, in these stages, of a scientific research project, values have to be kept out. And I think it's interesting, um, and let, let me add before I make this other point I just wanted to make is, I think it is um, not so, I mean, there is a, a crazily strong version of um, the value-free ideal um, that is, Science should be free of values, period. And that sounds a bit absurd because as you said, of course, no one really denies that um, picking a question that's supposed to be on the research agenda shouldn't be value guided. And um, that's probably a straw man, nobody holds this view. Um, and uh, the question is whether there isn't a kind of um, less extreme, much more convincing or sensible version of what we call the value-free ideal. Yeah, it's a sort of piecemeal value-free ideal. You say, for instance, well, this part of the research project could be free of values. Or uh, to pick up something you said early, um, earlier in our conversation, perhaps you say, well, in this part of the research, a certain type of evaluation shouldn't come up, but others are fine. Yeah, so that sounds like you are still kind of a modest defender or advocate of the value-free ideal, but um, it's a much more sensible um, version than this hardcore strict version that allows for no yeah. values at all. Does that make sense or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. The, one bit, the one bit that I would like to add as a further complication yeah. Um, which also kind of reflects some of the debates that happen in and around science. It's one thing to say, should science be value-free? And it's another thing to say, can science be value-free? Yeah. Um, it's sometimes said in, in moral philosophy that, that ought implies can, that one can only say that one ought to do something if it actually we are able to, to do it. And um, if one looks at say, many debates uh, in the sociology of science and in the history of science, there much research goes into documenting that even our very best science, people like Newton, people like Einstein, um, uh, quantum people working in quantum mechanics, were often 
motivated and influenced by considerations that strictly speaking we would count as considerations more falling on the side of non-epistemic values um, than just purely motivated by values falling on the other side. So we should always keep in mind that when we ask this question, should science be value free? Um, we should always say, well, should it, ought it to be in so far as we can actually do it? So we might say, um, one position might be is that in certain areas we should strive towards keeping certain values out, leaving it an open empirical question to what extent human, human scientists have actually been able to do this in the past. Yeah, right. and uh, I just, since we're um, at this, at, um, well, sort of um, presenting considerations that um, call into question this, um, this value-free ideal, however moderate in formulation or articulation, mm -hmm. Um, I just want to mention um, a couple of um, arguments that are very prominent in the recent debate on where um, values can enter, yeah? apart from picking a research agenda and things like that, where everybody would say probably quite quickly, yeah, all right, it's not a big, of course, values enter there. Mm -hmm. So I think one important consideration is um, the sort of the, the concepts used to, um, well, formulate the hypothesis you are actually testing in your study. Yeah? So think about um, concepts that are themselves somehow value-laden. Yeah? So if you're interested in doing a research project on, let's say, economic inequality in Germany or Austria, or on genocide, or on um, aggression in certain social contexts, well, I mean, you are doing that because you think, well, social inequalities aren't good. And genocide certainly isn't either. And aggression is, at least generally speaking, certainly also not good. And that's part of your motivation to do that research. Yeah, so um, they have a descriptive component, these concepts, and this descriptive component and making that measurable that descriptive component is certainly a task for the relevant scientific research, but still these um, concepts carry um, an evaluative um, component as well. And that might be the very reason why you're actually doing these research projects. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So that's one point. Concepts used to frame your whole research. And um, this can be perfectly good science, yeah? even though these um, concepts you have, are you're using are half descriptive, half evaluative. And the other um, important argument against the value-free ideal and um, perhaps, um, well, a plausible way of how values can enter after you've chosen your research topic and your funding decisions have been made and so on, um, is um, an evaluation of a certain kind of risk. So if you accept false hypotheses, so for instance, you are um, investigating whether a new drug has certain side effects, lethal side effects, and you accept, given the data you have after doing experiments, the, the hypothesis that it doesn't have these lethal side effects, but you're wrong, yeah? The, it's just uh, you, had, you didn't have enough data, you were just unlucky, you accepted a false hypothesis. And now the question is, suppose based on that hypothesis, you develop this um, new drug and you sell it on the market, patients take it, and let's suppose grave consequences of that are uh, one million people die. Yeah? It's a lethal um, side effects or adverse effects of this new drug. And um, in order to evaluate how grave the risk is, you have to look at the practical consequences of mistakes or errors you can commit as the one I've just described. And this is another sort of argument where people say, well, this is certainly part of science. I mean, as you said earlier, it's about accepting scientific hypotheses on the basis of evidence. That sounds very much like the heart of science. 
um, and then you act upon accepting a scientific hypothesis. Um, that involves evaluations that are, well, involving non-epistemic values. Yeah, you consider what the moral evaluation of certain practical consequences of mistakes are. So these are two important entry points for values of which people, uh, philosophers of science, say um, here we have a perfectly legitimate role of values in science and the science is good. Yeah, there's nothing to be complained about in terms of this science producing knowledge. It still involves evaluations of the kind we have mentioned earlier. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's, those are two examples. Yeah, but this is such an, such an important um, argument that you are mentioning there um, that I, I want to go over it one more time because um, it might be quite useful for our viewers to understand this argument from, from, mm -hmm. from, from different sides because it's one of the major arguments in the contemporary philosophical debate um, that leads people to accept the irreducible importance of non-epistemic values in science. This argument is sometimes called the inductive risk argument. Yes. Um, so let me go over it in, in a little bit more um, detail. So. Um, Assume you have a new drug and you want to find out whether that drug is safe. Now, there are two kinds of mistakes that might occur when you do this testing. On the one hand, you might think that the drug is harmless when the drug, in fact, is very dangerous. That's one kind of mistake. Um, you think the drug is harmless, but it is dangerous. That will cost you possibly in terms of human health and human deaths. There's a different kind of mistake that you might make. And this is the mistake that you think the drug is dangerous when the drug in fact is not dangerous. Well, when you think the drug is dangerous when it is not dangerous, then in fact you hinder what might be a quite successful new form of industry that might gain from producing this drug. So before you set out to test the drug, you have to ask yourself, which of these two mistakes is the more important? What should I be more worried about? That I think the drug is harmless when it is in fact dangerous, or that I think the drug is dangerous when it is in fact harmless? This is a kind of choice that you have to make. You cannot have it both ways. Think about it this way. If you want to make sure that the drug isn't dangerous, then you will make your test for the drug as tough as possible. So that there is as little chance as possible that you end up thinking that the drug is harmless when it is in fact dangerous. But of course, if you proceed in that way, then it might well occur that you think that the drug is dangerous when in fact it isn't. So the, the higher you place the demand on the drug, the less likely it is that you think that the drug is harmless when it is in fact dangerous, but the more likely it is that you think that the drug is dangerous when it is in fact harmless. Um, so you have to make the choice between those two kinds of risks. And nothing about the theory of induction or um, theory of epistemic logic or um, probability theory tells you on its own which of these two dangerous, which of those two dangers you should deem more important. So this is where values have to come in. Or at least it's now widely agreed that this is the point where values must come in. Sorry for going over the same ground once more. But I thought this is such an important point that I wanted a little bit to, to, to belabor it, even if it's a bit belaboring it perhaps a bit too much. No, 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 thanks, Martin. I think that was very helpful. And I think it also shows that um, these arguments, I mean, this you mentioned this now in, at length, this inductive risk argument, these arguments for um, uh, the claim that there are these entry points and legitimate entry points for values in science, 
they are quite sophisticated and they are very closely related to methodology here, statistical methodology in, in various sciences. Um, and that's, uh, I think it's important to have um, at least one glimpse at the sophistication and complexity of these mm -hmm. arguments. But let me just use this drug example that we both now um, uh, appeal to, um, to make a different um, point or a related but, dif but different point. And um, it seems to me kind of here it's an example or it's always discussed as an example of where you have industry funded drug research. Yeah, so uh, we have um, research that's certainly driven by a non-epistemic value, namely an economic value. Um, these um, pharmaceutical companies, they want to um, make a profit out of selling new drugs. And um, here I think we get um, to an interesting point or kind of a fork in the road of um, this science and values debate um, where um, the arguments we discussed, the, indu the inductive risk argument, this uh, thing about um, value-laden concepts, they are always emphasizing or typically emphasizing that you can have good science uh, in which values play a perfectly legitimate role. Yeah, and um, that is suppose that's the case. Then it's um, certainly not also true that whenever values play a role in science, uh, this role is legitimate and worthy of praise. Yeah, you seem to have cases where, for instance, industry-funded research um, is done but the non-epistemic value, so here an economic interest that's driving the research, somehow undermines or ruins or compromises um, the goal of producing um, scientific knowledge. For instance, knowledge about whether this new drug has certain side effects or adverse effects or whether it doesn't. Yeah? And I think one of the um, important questions currently is kind of within philosophy, but also in political debates concerning all kinds of things involving science is, well, how do we tell the difference? Whether we have a case where, well, there is value laden science, but it produces perfectly good knowledge, or do you have a case where the role of um, the values is somehow bad, illegitimate, undermining, um, the goal of producing reliable knowledge. I think that's that's a key question in in the current debate. And it yes, uh -huh. yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, um, the the question, the interesting question is: Can we give general rules to yeah. tell apart the good bits from the bad bits? Um, um, as you know, I'm a little bit skeptical about uh, trying to find general rules. Uh, my own inclination is to think that um, probably the best thing, well, I wouldn't say we can do, the best thing that I can do if I ask about my own contrib small contributions that I think I might be able to, to make here um, is to give some clear cases where yeah. The one is the case and the other is the case. And you have given the example of like a pharmaceutical company um, motivated by a profit uh, motive and therefore cuts corner when they test um, um, new pharmaceuticals. Of course, we can think about the tobacco industry famously um, sitting for decades on, on medical research that they were suppressing um, in order to, to sell their cigarettes, while at the same time the executives of the tobacco companies stopped smoking. So there was, an, there was a case of like suppressing science or in fact manipulating science with a profit motive to prevent the truth from coming out. Now, it's easy to see that those are cases where we think values are completely unacceptable. On the other hand, um, we have the inductive risk case, which is a, 
Um, someone might say, yeah, but how often does that occur in science? Isn't that just a specific thing about medical research? So people might say the inductive risk argument is kind of a bit of a marginal phenomenon. Um, but leaving that to one side, just how general, how common the case is, I just want to give an example of like the other end where you might think that um, someone might go out and motivate the central role of values. Clearly, um, some people have said all of climate science is through and through value laden because after all, the whole purpose of climate science is in the end to guarantee the well-being of the next generation and more broadly speaking, the survival of the human species. There's one way in which the values might come in. Or think of to just have another clear case in the mix Think of someone, and this goes back a bit to my earlier mention of aren't there lots of political values playing a role in science anyway. Assume that you are a feminist and you believe that much of Western biology is through and through influenced and shaped by um, male bias and negative portrayals of women. And you therefore think that you can't just simply fix it by saying, oh no, let's now be value neutral. Because when you think you are being value neutral, you are just perpetuating the anthropocentric biases of traditional biology. Maybe, maybe our own mindset when we do biology is shaped by male bias. And there are feminists who argue in this way and say, well, precisely because to be, to try to be neutral is in fact to remain captured by a form of thinking that traditional biology carries, which is anthropocentric. Actually, the best thing you can do to correct for that male bias is to allow um, the opposite values front and center in your own way of conducting biology. They admit this is not value neutral, but they rather say what it needs to correct for the massive influx from values from one direction is to have the courage of your own commitments and try to steer biology in the opposite direction. Now, I'm not quite sure to what extent and in what all areas of biology I find that argument convincing, but I have to admit that it has quite a bit of um, intellectual pull on my own thinking um, in those areas. So those were just two or three cases that pull us in rather different um, directions, all the way from the, from the utterly vicious to let's think about the Nazis trying to suppress certain forms of physics simply because of the involvement of, of Jewish physicists all the way to climate science, all the way to feminist critiques, say of, say, of biology. The difficult bit, I guess, is to work out in any given case, in any new given case we encounter, to which of those various um, paradigmatic cases the new case is similar to. That's, I think that's something we can agree on. It kind of reminds me of our last discussion where we also had, had such a point um, so I, I do think having this uh, discussion on a case-by-case -case basis, for instance, about this question, is this a legitimate role of values now or does it somehow undermine the production of knowledge? Um, it, I think it, even though it might be that at the end of discussing various cases, there is some sort of general um, rule or guideline or answer that's emerging, um, I think there is no other way than a sort of piecemeal approach in discussing real cases, yeah, like the ones you've mentioned. I, I, I think we're in total agreement here. And I would perhaps as a, as a last incentive or last question, um, I would like to at least um, say something, see how, how you react. So I think that um, there are... Um, if we have a look at this um, whole um, terrain we've, we've um, reviewed now in very broad strokes, of course, um, science and values, and we are somehow supposing that we are 
rejecting the value-free ideal or we have a very moderate version of it. Um, and uh, it still seems to me, even when, if we are in this position, that there are two very different topics um, that one could discuss with respect to science and values. So the first topic, I think, is um, really a question of knowledge. Yeah, what do the values do when scientific knowledge is created? And then we can argue about whether they somehow um, help to produce that knowledge or hinder to produce that knowledge and so on. I think that's a question of what philosophers call epistemology. It's concerned with truth, knowledge, whether we're justified in believing certain things. Um, that's one issue. Yeah? And I think, and maybe here you might disagree, this issue is to a certain extent independent from the next issue that I will put, uh, talk about now. So I think the first issue is rather something like, given we have these values, what does it do to the production of knowledge? Yeah? And the second point is rather talking about the evaluations themselves. Yeah? Whatever the evaluation is, perhaps you say, my research should, um, I don't know, promote democracy, or help um, the survival of future generations, your example with respect to climate science, um, you can have a dispute or a discussion yeah, about whether science should be led by these evaluations. Yeah, maybe you say, well, I don't find the argument convincing for taking care of future generations. Yeah, I'm just playing devil's advocate here, but I think having these these sorts of discussions is really engaging in moral debate and political dispute, depending on the exact nature of the evaluation. And that is something that's connected to this question about knowledge, the first question, but uh, it's certainly separable and perhaps should be separated from that. Do you agree with this? So, so just to make sure that I fully understand the distinction. So in the first case, we are asking um, quite generally, um, what is the likelihood of us gaining true beliefs about the world, yeah. given that certain values play a role in our inquiry? I mean, it's an epistemic, it's yeah. an epistemic question to the extent that we ask, do these values make it more likely or less likely that we reach true beliefs and to what extent? That's the first question. Yeah, I think that's one way of, of understanding. Okay, that. yeah, I'm just, yeah. just trying to, to get my head around it. And the second um, debate is not a sort of general question, but it rather is an, an inquiry not about science and about knowledge for, that we would do as like philosophers, but now we are thinking of us as citizens, asking how we would evaluate, say, the results that we get from different scientists um, and whether we should accept what this or that scientist tells us. Is that the distinction you're after? I think that's th this uh, view as um, citizens. I think that's, that's a very good way of picturing one particular case of what this second sort of question could amount to. Yeah, you could say, um, well, we get this piece of knowledge from science. It may be value laden, but now we ask, what does it mean for a certain political decision we are facing? Yeah, that's certainly um, an instance, an example of um, the second sort of question. And I think that is really, um, that's a political debate among citizens. And that should or could be separated from um, these questions of, um, I don't know, evaluating inductive risks or whether there is a role for values in, 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 in um, evaluating the consequences of making a certain kind of mistake. 
Yeah. Okay, so so just just to just to make sure that I fully understood it, and maybe also help our viewers to to get crystal clear on on on, on the distinction. Um, and I think I agree, if I understand the point correctly, that that on the one hand there is something like the epistemology of scientific knowledge, which asks what are the conditions, what are the likely conditions that our that what we take to be the truth actually is the truth. And when we ask this general question about the um, success conditions of our scientific knowledge, success with respect to truth, then we can ask what role or not should values play and which values. So that's something that we do as epistemologists. But we can also wear a different hat and become political scientists of science. Then we ask something like, how does scientific knowledge fit into our political life? Yeah, maybe, maybe this is the way to put it. The first question is, how does a certain element of politics, um, what role should it have in the production of knowledge is the first question. And the second question is, what role do, should scientific knowledge play when we decide how to live our lives, how to organize our political life, and how do we make political decisions involving science? Is that another, yeah. I mean, is I that, think, does that capture it? Yeah, I think that captures um, what I wanted to say. Okay. And I think it's important, one could at least discuss whether these are different um, questions, to which extent these are different questions, and maybe it's a good thing if um, these are different questions. So what I wanted to highlight is um, there are very different concerns that you can have in this um, model of um, a topic, values and science. Yeah, some are more of this, how do we live together? Yeah, a more of a political question. And the other is more concerned with, um, well, something one could say, workings that are internal to science. And they, these questions might involve values uh, that are not that important for, um, for um, other political discussions in, in which citizens are involved that aren't scientists. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I think I, I share your, your, your view that these questions may not be totally distinct, yeah. but that, no, that obviously they can't be totally distinct, but I also agree that their, their main emphasis and their main direction into which they look, um, these two questions um, are worth distinguishing and are not, are certainly not much is gained by simply conflating them. So I think we, on that point, we, are, we absolutely agree. That's right, and I think just as a, perhaps a final sentence on that, and I think that's, that's a larger topic we can't really settle here and one worth discussing. I think it might even be from the perspective of a citizen um, that um, a citizen thinks that's none of the concern for scientists, that's something we all discuss on an equal footing, although there might be evaluations that are more um, in the domain of scientists and, and the responsibility of scientists to decide. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Right, so we have, we, have, we have tried to bite into a very big topic um, today. We are, of course, totally aware of the fact that um, that we have only scratched the surface of this difficulty and complicated issue. But we'll be delighted if um, it has been some food for thought for you. And we promise that we will follow up on some of those issues that we discussed today in future broadcasts. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Alex. And see you all again, hopefully, very soon. Bye-bye.